is Ralph from Happy Dog Training and welcome to another episode of Dog Talk. Today's episode is a little different because it's our first interview episode and it covers canine nutrition. I will be speaking with certified canine nutritionist Kay Stewart from Real Dog, a company here in San Diego, and we will go over all aspects of canine nutrition that you always wanted to know but never had anybody to ask. So we're going to talk about the transition into raw food, how we get from our current diet to a raw diet, or simply how to improve your current diet with toppers and things you can do to make kibble better and less bad for your dog, even if you wanna, don't want to go all the way to the raw side of it. We're going to touch on the limitations that we encounter when we talk to veterinarians about canine nutrition because it's not their main expertise. And uh, Kay used to work in the veterinary field. She is a vet tech, was trained vet tech and a researcher of decades. So she is a very scientific person and a wonderful person to talk to about this, super knowledgeable on the canine nutrition. And you'll see, it was a great conversation. And we're going to touch on a lot of details, but also some high level points. We'll definitely address some of the main concerns that people have and that vets often also take with um, raw feeding in particular, which would be the contamination, potentially getting sick from salmonella and things like that, or just getting the balance right. Make sure your dog actually has a balanced diet and get all the nutrition they need, because it's not just about, oh, let me boil some chicken and add some rice. That's not the way to go. It needs to be still a balanced diet. And all of these things will be covered. At the end of the episode, we also have a discount code and tons of recommendations throughout. All the links will be in the show notes as, as always. But the canine nutritional course that is offered to dog owners at this point is very affordable and with a discount code becomes even a lot cheaper. And it will teach you everything you need to know to really transition your dog either to raw or just make your food better in general and understand dog food in general better. Because that's one of the things. Well, what do you actually feed? What is right? What is not so ideal? So it was a broad conversation. It was a wide ranging conversation. Super interesting. I found it intriguing. And I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, you will definitely get a lot out of this. There's a lot to be learned here. And on the supplemental resources in the show notes, you will find more things that are super interesting to explore. So I hope you enjoy what we're going to talk about. And let's get started. Today, we're talking with canine nutritionist Kay Stewart from Real Dog. And uh, we're going to touch on a variety of things about nutrition and the limitations of the veterinary world around nutrition. But it's going to be an interesting conversation and it's going to fit right in with all the other things that were talked about on nutrition in the past. So without further ado, welcome Kay Stewart. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Tell us, um, about, tell us about yourself. Yeah. My background is I'm a registered veterinary technician. I graduated from Purdue University way back in the 80s. Um, I spent 32 years of my career in biomedical research, and that ended in 2017. Um, I was a little bit out of alignment when I was in research because dogs are really my passion. Mm -hmm. So that job ending was really a good thing. Didn't feel like it at the time. Um, but now, these things into... always hit you kind of like when you don't expect them, and it turns out to be great <laughs> at the end, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, but I found this position at Real Dog Box as a researcher and writer for their mm -hmm. educational side of their um, company, Feed mm -hmm. Real Movement, Feed mm -hmm. Real Institute. And it has been the best blending of my passion for dogs and my love for writing, researching, teaching. Um, when I was in biomedical research, I was at the University of Notre Dame. I taught classes to students interested in veterinary medicine. I was a mm -hmm. mentor for them to go on to vet school. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of all, it took all of my passions in this position and really blended them well. So I've been with Real Dog, it'll be two years in June. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, I have learned a wealth of information. I was trained as a regular vet tech. Um, like all of us are trained, that mm -hmm. kibble is what you feed your dogs. Yeah. It's very common in the vet and, world and just the food day push, right, in the vet offices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I had a total paradigm shift, um, you know, the smack your head on your head, your forehead, mm -hmm. thinking, why did it take me almost 40 years to realize this? Mm -hmm. um, but it's been amazing to learn a whole new 
way to feed dogs and it's exciting and it's fun. Um, I have a dog that I, I hadn't had a dog for five years and Mm. I now have a dog where I'm living and converting her to raw has been so exciting for me. This journey has just been great. Oh yeah, raw feeding. I've I've seen the changes I've seen with my own dogs and with some client dogs that make the switch. It's just, this is a no brainer once you see how dogs respond to that, how their health changes, how everything just like becomes better overall. It's just, it's eye opening. Yes. I 100%. It is. (laughs) So again, you think, why did it take me so long? (laughs) So maybe like a, a, quick, a quick insert on my end. So Kay reached out. Um, I was actually looking to talk to a canine nutritionist. And I had her send me a couple of articles. And your research background came absolutely through in those. So as I mentioned when we mm-hmm. talked initially, the length, the depth, the detail, um, it's long-form content of high quality and high, um, very super valuable information that's just going to stand the test of time. So it's not like one of those yeah. quick uh, sales pitch articles, like optimized for SEO only, and that's it. So it's like super interesting to read. And you learn something. So from from the two articles that you just sent me, it was so mm-hmm. informative, and I was immediately okay. That's the kind of person I want to talk to. <laughs> and then Great. yeah, when you told me about your background and that you actually worked in the veterinary field before, and now do this is also perfect transition because everybody when they have a dog issue, they go to the vet. No matter what the dog issue is, right? Even if the vet has no qualification like nutrition or training or behavior, these are not things vets are trained in. And there's no shame exactly. in that. It's just not veterinary medicine. Right? Medicine is something else. Right. But everybody goes to the vet with, oh, it's a dog issue. The vet should know. And that's, um, it's like a car mechanic. Well, they won't know everything about your car, right? It depends on what of the car is broken. So if it's one of those new hybrid electrician battery cars, <laughs> electric yes. battery cars, uh, the, the, the mechanic is like, mm, you're going to send you to like the shop or something because I oh, can't, can't open that thing up. So it really depends what part of the dog you're dealing with. So, But okay, I um, don't want to ramble on too much. So tell us why, um, why nutrition is so important for health, but also for behavior with dogs. Right. Well, the main thing, what, I mean, what we put in our body, obviously, is what, how our body is going to function. You are what you eat. We've all heard that mm-hmm. all of our lives. And it's so true. Um, and, but with the dog, what we've found with the um, gut microbiome, that is the colony of bacteria and fungus and all of the other microorganisms that live in the um, intestinal tract, we find that if that is not balanced, then the dog is not getting all of the neurotransmitters that they need. Um, 90% of the serotonin, the happy hormone, is produced by the gut microbiome. So if that gut microbiome is not balanced and not producing that, you're going to have behavioral issues. Mm-hmm. Um, dopamine is produced there. GABA, um, or yeah, GABA, mm-hmm. dopamine, neuro or norepinephrine, um, acetylcholine, all of those are produced in the gut. All of those are neurotransmitters for behavior. So if that gut is not working, you're not going to have the proper neurotransmitters working and the brain's not getting the right information. And how you can how can you train a dog if they're not you know don't have all those neuroreceptors or neurotransmitters yeah it definitely has an impact so when when we get dogs in training and then like let's say let's not name brand names but let's say like really low quality food it definitely shows not just in their health it shows in their behavior it shows in their uh, ability to think Mm -hmm. and process and learn sometimes goes slower because of that and right. in like, if you look at professional dogs and professional dogs, meaning like service dogs or even sport dogs mm-hmm. or military police, even to some degree that those are, I don't think they pay that much attention to it, but sport dog people, particularly with dogs are like high level athletes. Food right. is one of the right. main things because you can't function unless you have the right nutrition. Um, well, so and, important. And that gut microbiome controls everything else yeah. too you know the longevity of the dog the heart the um cognitive ability of the dog mm. so and nutrition plays a role in all aspects and you have microbiome throughout your body the skin microbiome is so dependent on what we give it mm. um, nutritionally if you have poor quality food and it doesn't have any omega-3s in there that skin does not have the right fatty acids that it needs to produce healthy tissue. 
yeah. and then you get hot spots and itchy spots and constant licking and chewing and yeah. and it's all because it starts from inside not mm-hmm. outside people want to put stuff on the outside that's not going to help you have to start with what's going in <laughs> i think i think that's a common thing because we, we have so accustomed we come accustomed to just focusing oh there's an itch or there's a there's a red spot mm-hmm. and oh, it's an allergy against something or where did it come from and most people don't think well maybe it comes from what i'm feeding my dog they always think it's or maybe it's just one ingredient in the food they don't think like it's the quality right. of the food overall or or maybe it's just something in the environment something in my yard and then they end up with allergy shots and, and obviously they'll work it's not that they won't but it's it's maybe not the best approach, right? You want you want to make right. sure the dog's healthy first. Um, like when you when you mentioned the gut biome so much, it kind of reminds me of what when I had my nutritional business. What everybody in that world basically always says: you can't be healthy unless your gut is healthy. And it all exactly. it all starts in your gut. If that's not right, nothing else will be. It's just like affects everything in your body. It's so important. Every aspect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's just so many of those diseases that we hear about, leaky gut syndrome, yeah. um, ir- irritable bowel syndrome. It's all related to that. If the gut is not healthy, you're going to have issues. Leaky gut syndrome is where the cells aren't butting up against each other. So stuff is getting through into the um, cardiovascular system, mm-hmm. into the bloodstream. And so... Then you have these foreign objects going into the bloodstream that the body's, of course, going to attack as an mm. an, as an allergen yeah. and build antibodies against, and you're going to have this huge reaction. So, yes, if that gut isn't protect, that's your protection against all of that. Mm. And if it's not good and solid and healthy, you're going to have all kinds of inflammation and allergies and yeah. uh, problems. Yeah, it's just very, very important. And healthy nutrition is the pathway to that. <laughs> Most, Absolutely. Most definitely. Anything else you want to add to that or is that sums up? Well, I think much? the biggest thing is that we have to, to properly feed that gut. And what we're finding is with kibble, it's the level of nutrition that's in kibble is not feeding that gut microbiome. Mm. If you switch a dog to a raw diet, that microbiome just blossoms. You get a yeah. lot of... Um, diversity in the bacteria, you get um, all those benefits almost immediately. Within a couple of weeks, you'll start seeing the skin and hair look better. Mm -hmm. Um, Behavior can change very, very quickly. So we recommend that you feed a variety of really high quality proteins, that you feed seafood, that you feed um, organ meat for their Mm -hmm. mineral and vitamins uh, that they need. And that way you can balance it out. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, yeah. more. But that's a big concern is, okay, if I feed my dog raw, that doesn't mean chicken and rice. Yeah. I mean, we, we yeah. have a full formula. <laughs> yeah. No, it definitely doesn't mean that at all. It's like most, mostly meat <laughs> and then some vegetables for the balance. And that's absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, just like uh, for, for everybody listening. So we're going to actually talk about a... Um, an educational course that Real Dog offers to dog owners where you can learn all of that and more and how to do all this properly at, towards the end of the course. So if some of those technical details seem a little bit um, too much for some, don't worry. You don't have to like learn any of that right now. We're going to have more on that <laughs> and how you can really educate yourself. There's so much to learn. So this is just so an much. overview. <laughs> just look at that. that there's, there will be more where mm. you can, as, as a dog owner, make some changes and how to get started later. Right, so. right. Um, but yeah, no, so that's so how... Um, How many um, dogs have you observed like in person the change from kibble Mm -hmm. to raw with? Mm -hmm. And what were the, like you mentioned a couple of things like skin and and, and Mm -hmm. so forth already. Mm -hmm. What was like the main change you've seen with the dogs you've observed it with? That I've observed. Now, like I said, Mm -hmm. this, I'm new on this journey, Mm -hmm. um, but I've seen a lot of um, people start their dogs on this journey because I've talked to them. And I think the first thing they notice is Mm -hmm. skin and hair coat. Yeah. Um, and then I, uh, one of my friends that switched, I think her dog was 12 at the time, a shepherd mix, mm-hmm. um, who was very lethargic, um, poor hair quality, poor hair, skin quality. And within weeks, the dog was wanting to go out jogging again. So you saw a joint improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, the dog lost weight and they just, 
became almost puppy like. Her son came home from college and was like, I don't know what you did to the dog, but keep doing it. <laughs> you know, yeah. and he was amazed because yeah. of the transformation. And so he went from leaving to with this lethargic older dog to mm. coming home to a very frisky, healthy looking dog. And within weeks, her dog would not. She forgot the raw food and she gave it kibble mm. and it just sat there and looked at her and said, no. Yeah. Not taking that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and the dog that I've transitioned here too, we had some kibble that we were trying to use up and she'll leave it in her bowl. She's like, nope. Yeah. So we, we're going to donate it. <laughs> yeah. Because she, she won't eat it. <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't want this anymore. I know you have better. Give me that. Give me that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you, you, haven't, you haven't really seen a dog come alive until they eat a bowl of raw meat. It's just like. Yes. A marvelous thing mm -hmm. to watch on the eyes light up. Oh my God. <laughs> like, where's this been? <laughs> well, and they see you preparing it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and uh, I prepare like a week at a time and she yeah. knows when I'm doing that. And oh, she's yeah. watching me and, you know, of course I have to give her a couple of scraps here and there because, yeah. and what's been interesting with this dog is at first she wouldn't take things raw. I had to mm -hmm. very lightly cook them. I mean, yeah. very lightly. Um, and now she's to the point where she'll take everything raw. So oh, that's actually you have a, to work with your dog. Yeah, that's actually interesting. So let, let's uh, let's spend a moment on that because I had a couple yeah. of clients who tried raw. They wanted to try raw. I said, my dog doesn't eat it. So right. cooking it a little bit has been the answer for what you've seen as a transitional step. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, and I think it's a textural thing mm -hmm. for one. Yeah. Um, and they they don't know. Like they've yeah. been eating these little pieces of kibble yeah. and they're like, what is this? Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't that way with muscle meat. She would always eat the muscle meat raw. Mm -hmm. But with raw meaty bones, mm -hmm. she wouldn't chew those. So I literally would put them in a pan of boiling water for 30 to 45 seconds. And mm -hmm. that was enough. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm not taking any nutrients out. Mm -hmm. But it was enough to, for her to say, okay, I can eat yeah. this. And, um, and to be clear and for anyone cooking. listening, never chicken bones, right? Mm -hmm. on, on cooking. Not on cooking, yeah. no. Yeah, but yeah. even with, you know, I did chicken backs for that 30 mm -hmm. seconds. That's yeah. not cooking them yeah. through. Um, but never, never any cooked bones. <clears throat> never. Raw chicken bones are great. Yes, They're actually yeah. really good for them because of mm -hmm. the texture of them. They, they are hollow for the most mm -hmm. part. And so they're not hard to chew. Yeah. They can digest them easily. Um, they clean their teeth when they're chewing on them. They're, mm. they're wonderful. So, no, I wouldn't fully, I wouldn't give her anything fully cooked. Um, I know people have said, yeah, I gave my dog the rotisserie chicken bones. I'm like, no, 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 no. no, no That's yeah. not what no. we're talking <laughs> yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely not. Raw chicken bones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you can try, you know, just a tiny bit of, of, of cooking. Searing the meat just on the outside is enough to bring that flavor up. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't like organ meat. And mm -hmm. still is a little iffy with it, um, but she will take it raw now. Mm -hmm. And when I was preparing her last set of meals, I handed her raw liver and she took it right out of my hand. I'm like, yes, yeah. I don't have to saute it anymore. Um, so you just have to work with them. And it could take a mm -hmm. little while for them to get used to it. Introduce one component at a time yeah. and say, okay, now you're, you're liking the raw meaty bones. Let's try the organ meat. Um, some dogs, you give them a full meal of all raw and they'll just go right at it. Mm -hmm. It just really depends. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so what, what about when people have concerns about the dog getting sick from feeding raw? What do you, so, uh, you mean like bacterial? Yeah. Bacterial uh, contamination. Yeah. Salmonella, or E. coli, things like that. Right. So with the, in the veterinary world, the two biggest concerns are that, Clients are going to get sick and their dogs are going to get sick from raw products because of bacterial contamination. And it's actually interesting because there have been more reported cases of people getting sick from salmonella from kibble than there have been from raw. If oh, yeah. you look at the studies. I did not notice. That's um, interesting. Okay. Yes. The one study I read, mm -hmm. it was 16,000 families surveyed. Mm -hmm. And this was done in Sweden, which they're far ahead of us with the raw feeding. Mm -hmm. um, there were three cases of infectious disease transmitted from the dog to the people related to the food. Three out of 16,000. Mm -hmm. um, in that same time period, there were 132 cases of salmonella linked to kibble in the United States. So, I mean, think of all those recalls that we hear oh, with kibble. Uh, yeah. A lot of them are for salmonella. Yeah. So... 
that's what I would be concerned about. Those toddlers that are running around mm. grabbing the kibble and putting it in their mouth. Um, they're more apt to get sick from that at this point, I, I feel. Um, yeah. I think with raw feeders that we're very, very conscientious about keeping our areas clean. Uh, as soon as Kona's done eating, I wash her bowl with soap and water. Mm. You know, we clean the area that we prep with. We, we do take some precautions because mm. it, it is raw. And so you yeah. want to make sure it's clean. Yeah, of course. The other thing is, I'm sorry, we're getting high quality, human quality meat. We are not getting scraps that are discards or mm. trash or anything. I mean, this is human grade meat that we're feeding. Yeah. And all, all of these things make a huge difference. So like that's this concern about that your kids will get sick when you feed your dog raw. I, I've, uh, there's been court orders where judges ordered people to not feed their, the dog raw anymore. They will take their kids. I mean, the Child Protective Service is crazy here in the U.S. And that is just insane. When, so when, when we make ourselves uh, a steak or a uh, chicken or something, we cook it. We handle a raw piece of meat in that moment. You got to wash your hands. You got to clean the area. You have to do all these things for ourselves. If you just take the same precautions when you prepare raw dog food, there is no problem. It's just you have right. to just do what we do when we, when we do it with our own food. Well, and the other thing that's really interesting is they've shown that with the raw diet, the bacteria in the dog's gut microbiome increases, the um, lactobacillus, which is what is in probiotics, mm -hmm. increases, and their bad bacteria, um, the clostridium, actually decreases. Mm -hmm. So they are actually getting a better microbiome that's safer. So their feces is going to be less likely to have pathogenic bacteria in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing people don't realize is the dog's pH, the stomach pH, the, um, bad, the stomach acid is so low. It's between one and two when they're raw fed. Mm -hmm. Those bacteria cannot survive yep. the stomach. In kibble fed dogs, it's up to three and four the pH is, mm -hmm. so it's um, not nearly as acidic, the bacteria can survive in those situations. Yeah. So dogs are built to eat raw food. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, think about the wolf out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they're not, I mean, they they're can, not getting killed. <laughs> they, they can bury a bone on the side mm -hmm. of the road, leave it there rotting for like five months, dig it up, it's green and blue, eat it and be fine. Right, so it's, Absolutely. Um, there is actually, I'm going to link this in the show notes for everybody. There is a write-up on a holistic veterinarian's website about exactly that, where they talk about uh, um, how the uh, pH in the dog's stomach changes after 15 days of raw mm -hmm. feeding, and your dog can no longer get sick of any of these things, like salmonella, back, um, campobacti, um, well, e. Coli, e. coli, and all that other stuff. It's like after 15 days of raw feeding, you're, you're fine. And to your point... Well, uh Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. In their mouth, they also have the enzyme lysosomes yeah. that kill bacteria. Yeah. So it starts in their mouth. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many, so many things that are just misunderstood. There was. Um, mm -hmm. So here, here's something. Well, I think this is also interesting, and you may have heard of this. Um, this is a study that was published on the NHI, uh, on the National Institute of Health website. And it was mm -hmm. Stanley Korn, the guy who wrote Dogs for Dummies, like this PhD pro right. uh, dog professor who. Uh, who is completely opposed to raw feeding. He like absolutely right. goes nuts over it. Yeah. It's, just, it's the craziest thing on earth. And there was a study done where they took kibble fed dogs and they gave them chicken necks infested with campobacter and they got sick. Well, mm -hmm. obviously, <laughs> I mean, that's like obviously got <laughs> yeah. sick. Right? Right, if if right. this was a raw fed dog, they would not have gotten sick. It would have been a completely non-event. Right. But then he goes and uses that, oh, see, 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 they get sick when they eat this. And that is so misleading. It's like completely mm, the opposite so of what raw feeding is about, right? right. And to right. your point, um, healthy human quality food, this is what you need to do. I, I personally, I found a meat farm that delivers to a holistic, uh, to a health food store around here. They drive mm -hmm. around, deliver meat, and they bring it to my house too every other week. And I get high quality organ meats. I get high quality chicken necks, high quality ground beef, no antibiotics, no growth hormones. And Absolutely. never had in like, like five, six years now mm. doing this, never had anything quality wise. Way well, less I, just, I just moved to the Nashville, Tennessee area mm -hmm. and found a raw feeding co-op mm -hmm. in Springfield, Tennessee, which is just about an hour from where I'm living. And everything there is human quality, mm -hmm. um, but it's sold for dogs. And 
I found, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, mm -hmm. it's worth the hour drive. I'm going to set it up where I go once a month, mm -hmm. figure out what I need for the entire month. They have huge variety. Um, so that's what people need to realize that it doesn't have to be real expensive. It yeah. doesn't have to be hard and it's fun. <laughs> I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you, if you buy it bulk and you freeze it, it's not that expensive to transition that it gets yeah. expensive when you have a lot of dogs, like, <laughs> well, <of course. laughs> but if you have one dog, it's very doable. It's not like, um, I, I would even say if you are on like some of the really expensive vet foods they sell in their offices. A transition mm -hmm. to raw will not be a huge price difference. It will be like minor no. and so much better. I mean, it's not right, even... Right, yeah. Well, and the other thing people have to keep in mind, so if raw-fed dogs are that much healthier, yes. your vet costs are going to go way down. Um, mm -hmm. You're not going to be going to the vet for skin issues, for dental issues, for joint issues. Um, and so you have to look at, look at the budget for the year and mm -hmm. really figure out what it is you want to spend your money on. Do you want to spend it on poor food and high vet bills? Or mm -hmm. do you want to spend it on high quality food? Oh, that's such an important point. And it's, I, I've been telling my clients that too for a long time. And it's my personal experience over right. um, like probably 12 years of feeding custom food at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Five, seven years cooked and then five years, last five years raw. 100%. I mean, my dogs rarely have to go to the vet. They are so much mm -hmm. healthier. They live longer. Um, it's just a game changer. You save so much more on vet expenses and you have more time mm -hmm. with your dog. The, the higher cost of feeding on a weekly basis is so much offset. It's just not even... It's, right. No Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. ultimately not more expensive. It just looks more expensive initially because you know, I have right. these higher costs every week, but there's so many uh, cost savings down the line and longevity and health that just offset that. Above Absolutely. And then the other thing that the veterinarians worry about is imbalances. Mm -hmm. They're, like I said, people, you know, they think chicken and rice is feeding them raw. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I yeah. get the, I understand where veterinarians are concerned with that. Mm -hmm. But that's why we developed this dog um, parent course to mm -hmm. teach them how to do it correctly, yeah. practically, and on a budget. And so that way they aren't causing imbalances and they're not bogged down with spreadsheets and trying to figure out every meal being perfectly balanced. Mm -hmm. um, our course is just so practical. It tells you how to do it easily. And I mean, think about yourself. Every meal yeah. do you worry about, is it 100% balanced? Of course not. Yeah. It's balanced over time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we really try to make it easy, um, cost effective and fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I could, couldn't agree more. That, that's why it resonated so much with me when, when you reached out and I looked, I looked at Real <laughs> yeah. Dog and everything we discussed because it so reflects my own experience. And with, mm -hmm. my, with the raw feeding, it's been, it's been the answer to so many, so many issues, um, health-wise, joint-wise, skin-wise, allergy-wise. And it, some people just don't want to do it. I get that. But it's... Uh, they don't want to touch raw meat or whatever reason they, they can't afford it. I mean, it's, just, it's a little bit more expensive right. than like the cheapest kibble you can buy, but that's all you can do. And that's all you can do. Right? It's, it's, right. you got to do what you can do. Feed the best food you can afford and do better when you can. It's basically what I tell people. Well, and the other thing that we really advocate for, we understand not everybody mm -hmm. can go full raw. Yeah. We understand that. Yeah. And what we advocate for then just add some kibble toppers. Mm. little things blueberries dogs do great with blueberries now the particular dog i have here won't touch them but <laughs> most dogs love them mm. and they have antioxidants and they have you know all these different vitamins in them something that small yeah um, i know you and i talked about a study last time we talked about at purdue just putting greens on yeah. a dog's kibble mm -hmm. three times a week reduce the chance of bladder cancer in yep. these particular dogs by 90 percent yeah, that was so the, um, you, the terrier bladder cancer study, right? Yes, yeah. yes. And so just by adding some, some uh, small oily fish mm -hmm. like anchovies or herring or um, sardines yeah. to your dog's kibble, that can really balance out those fatty acids that are missing in mm -hmm. the kibble. Yeah. And so that can help with itchy skin just by doing that. You'd mm -hmm. be amazed how those little kibble toppers can really make a difference is it as much as a full raw no of course not. but it can still make a huge difference 
Yeah, and also the greens, as I understand, also prevent the glycemic spike when the food has a lot of carbs, like a lot of kibbles do. Mm -hmm. So my, most kibbles have like 45% carbs in them, which is basically sugar. So when you get some right. broccoli in there or you get some spinach in there or other leafy greens, it can absolutely prevent the, the sugar spikes and just that alone can be a benefit for, for health. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, then you're looking at less um, chance of diabetes, yep. uh, other things that those carbs are really, really hard on the dog's body. Every nutritionist will tell you, every veterinary nutritionist will admit dogs have absolutely no requirement for carbohydrates in their diet. Yep. And yet... The kibble companies have anywhere from 26. I mean, some of them are really low now. Mm -hmm. I've seen some down to 5%, um, but as high as 60, 65%. Oh, uh, yeah. And that their bodies, it takes so much work for them to process that. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're seeing dogs not live as long. Their bodies literally wear out. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's, it's even like if you find, so the lowest kibble that I usually have um, pe people try is Origin which mm -hmm. uh, the, the Canadian company from Champion Pet Foods. And right. I know there's some concern now because Mars bought it, but I, I, right. I, I don't even, I'm, I'm <laughs> that's not. a whole other program. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's I'm, a whole I'm, other podcast. <laughs> it's a whole other podcast. I'm personally not so sure that's going to change a whole lot because they want to tap into that market not. and leave, leave them right. be and like do their thing. Well, we, we shall see, right? But um, yeah. their, their carbs is only 26% and the red is just meat, 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 meat. So you look at the label, like the first mm -hmm. 15, 16 ingredients, different types of meat and fish and meat and meat and meat and organs. Right. Right. And that's and, great. And no fillers. It's like, it's, yeah, huh? that's a different kind of food than, oh, chicken meal, rice, brewer's yeast, rice, squash, pea protein. Pea okay. Protein, yes, yes. You know, those legumes, they're really tough on, yeah. on the, the dog. Um, yeah. So, again, like you said, you have to figure out what it is that mm. you can get. Mm -hmm. the best you can buy. And then I am such a firm believer in the kibble toppers for any, I mean, as you're making a salad for yourself or you're making yep. chicken for your family, toss a few pieces of raw chicken on your dog's bowl or, mm -hmm. you know, just you, a you mean, you mean for my own like salad that. or for my dog? <laughs> <laughs> when you make your own salad or if you make your dog salad, yeah. then you can share it. <laughs> okay. I, I think I'll pass on the raw chicken for my own salad. Um, oh yeah, I think that would yeah, be. Yeah. Um, so what, what other um, things have you observed? I mean, you, you have a veterinary background, you've seen both sides of this equation. So, I mean, the mm -hmm. uh, getting getting sick is one and the dogs can use carbs. I mean, they can eat carbs. So I think that's right. another um, another misleading thing that's, again, corn right. put that out because it's again against raw feeding. But they can absolutely eat carbs when they live with us and we feed them that stuff so that bodies adjust to right. that and that pH, that pH goes right. up just like ours. That doesn't mean that's what they should be eating, right? So right. It's that I like to say they can survive, yes. but they can't thrive. And that's why that we, um, you know, why feeding them so much, mm -hmm. you can't, they're not going to survive or thrive. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the same with, with human food. Like when you have the FDA guidelines on what the minimal amount of vitamins and minerals on some things is that you should consume, try to just right. do that and see if you're healthy. You're just remaining right. alive. You're not going to be like a right. really agile, happy, healthy, active mm -hmm. person. You're going to be like slobbing around and not dying, but you're not going to be super healthy. Right. It's the same with the dog right. food standards. It's just like a bare minimum. What do they need to live so, right. so they don't die on us, right? That right. shouldn't be the benchmark for, oh, that's good enough. <laughs> oh. Right, right. Exactly. I mean, it's like that study that the guy did where he ate McDonald's, all those, or did you ever see that super size me? It was oh, video. yeah. <laughs> eat McDonald's I mean, for a month, see what happens. It. Yeah. He, yeah. He, that's the same kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He ate all that, and his body, but he, his body shut down. And I feel like when we're feeding this really poor kibble, that's why our dogs are dying young. They just, yep. their bodies cannot handle it. Yeah. And it, it makes me sad. <laughs> no, we've, I mean, uh, I, read, I read this whole story once how we got into this kibble situation. I, I don't know if it's 100% true or not, but um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the extruder who makes a lot of this kibble, just kills all the calories in the process. It's like this machine that also makes this check cereal. Right. I think they invented that, right? And they blast mm -hmm. this food paste through that to make the kibbles. Um, not for all dog foods, but for a good number of them. And that just right. cooks everything to death. And then they fortify it again with, with like synthetic vitamins to the bare mm -hmm. minimum. 
yeah, that can't lead to long-term good health. It's just not right. Right. No. You can't um, put synthetic vitamins and minerals in and correct for a, a, a poor quality of meat. It doesn't work. Your body doesn't understand what those synthetics are. Um, so yeah, there's just, you have to have good ingredients and the way kibble is produced makes it very difficult to have good ingredients. Talk, talk a little bit more about the difference between whole food supplementation and synthetic supplementation, because I think that's also okay. very confusing. For yeah. Me. So whole food supplementation, like I was saying for allergies, um, and itchy skin, if you give small oily fish, that's going to balance out the omegas, the fatty acids in their body. If you give um, medicine, you're going to block some of those receptors. You're going to not get to the root cause. You're going to mask the symptoms, but not get to the root cause of those. Um, and so I, myself, I can give you a great example. I have terrible seasonal allergies. And I was taking, and I also am allergic to all animals, ironically. Oh, <laughs> so I was taking... <laughs> um, a decongestant and an antihistamine every day, mm -hmm. all year round, because of living with animals, and you know. And then I also worked with lab animals. Um, I heard about quercetin that's in green tea and some of the fruits and vegetables, and try to decide to give it a try. I drink green tea every day. I haven't taken allergy medicine for a year and a half, mm -hmm. um, and this is prime. I'm in Middle Tennessee, and mm -hmm. this is prime spring season, which when I visited here, when my daughters lived here before, I literally had to get a prednisone injection because my allergies got so bad. Mm. I have not taken any allergy medication for 18 months since I started. So that's a great example of natural supplementation versus allergy meds. Yeah. Um, and the same with dogs. So that you can give that same green tea or other things with the quercetin in it that really mm -hmm. helps with allergies. You can give um, joint supplements, glucosamine mm -hmm. and chondritin, mm -hmm. chicken feet, tracheas, anything that has that cartilage still mm -hmm. in it. Shark cartilage. That's a great, mm -hmm. yes, that's a great way to give them natural supplements. Their body knows what to do with that. Yeah. It doesn't know what to do with artificial supplements. It doesn't know what to do with the medicines. And, and to me, you read those medicine inserts um, the, the drug inserts and it's scary, you know, it could cause seizures, can cause yeah. diarrhea, vomiting. Oh, and even death, you know, so can, yeah. anytime you can do a natural sub, um, supplement, mm -hmm. you're better off. Yeah. Are there times where your dog's going to need some Western medicine? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying that you never will, mm -hmm. but and you know, if you I, can use a natural supplement, please do. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that, that that thing is a very important point. So nutrition will prevent a lot of vet visits, right. but this is not like, we're not trying to denigrate veterinarians at all. Like, veterinarians yeah, are highly not. trained medical professionals. I My vets have saved my dog's lives on several occasions, um, like injuries and stuff like that, and the blows sure. one time. So absolutely, vets know a lot about medicine and surgery, and sometimes you need drugs, and sometimes you need all of the best, better, best of medicine has to offer, and then some. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this is not about um, putting that aside or not uh, respecting that profession. This is about... No. They're just not trained in nutrition. It's just not their field, right? So there, there is now certified nutritionists for a reason. There is college degrees in canine nutrition for a reason. It's a completely yes. separate field. And when you see, when you when you talk to a canine nutritionist like a K or others, I mean, you're not the only one at this point, right? It's like it's right. become a broad, broad field. Luckily, it's absolutely. Good. There's a lot of them now, which is great. Um, you, you immediately see the difference in the way they, they understand nutrition. They understand how nutrition influences the body. It's more in line with what we call functional medicine in the human world. Absolutely. Um, and that mm -hmm. it makes such a big difference. It, I mean, I've, I've read, I mean, I've, maybe that's an exaggeration too, but I read in several uh, papers over the years that you could probably clear or, or cure 90% of type 2 diabetes by just nutrition if people actually mm -hmm. were to do it differently, eat differently. Um, type one, mm -hmm. obviously not, but type two, right, um, right. and maybe a very right. high cure rate just based on food, whatever the number is. 
So right. yeah, it's a, it makes a big difference. Uh, you need Vestal medicine, you need all that, those treatments, you need a lot of those medications on certain conditions, absolutely. But for general health in the long term, nutrition is just superior to keep your body functioning well, stay healthy, stay well. I mean, just like you said, super size me. If we eat junk food all day long, <laughs> we're not going to feel well. Right. If we eat a balanced diet, we're going to feel a lot better, have a lot more energy and just overall uh, mm -hmm. healthier. So it's the same, same for dogs as it for us. Right? So, um, yeah, and, and one of the things, um, we can talk about the course that mm -hmm. I did, but yeah. one of the things that I really emphasize is creating a team with a, a nutrition team with your veterinarian mm -hmm. is really important because they're the ones that can get the blood work for you and, and make yes. sure that your dog is not getting imbalanced mm -hmm. in different nutrients. Um, they need to be in part of the loop and a lot of veterinarians are against raw feeding for two reasons. They they didn't get, like you said, they, their schooling, they may have gotten one course in nutrition. Um, but the odd thing is, is the book that most of the schools use is written by the company that also makes Hills dog food. So it's a kibble company's mm -hmm. book, basically, that they're learning from. And so Perfect. They, they're could go trained wrong. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that they are ignorant about it. They just mm -hmm. haven't learned about it. And yeah. I never want to um, talk against the veterinarians because they're so key in keeping your dog yeah. healthy. But in this case, talk to them about raw mm -hmm. feeding. So many people are afraid to tell their vets that they're raw feeding because their vets are going to say, no, that's not good. You go in there with the knowledge that this is what I'm doing. This mm -hmm. is what changed with my dog. You know, since I've been raw feeding, look at the skin on mm -hmm. this dog. Look at the fur. Look at his teeth. Um, yeah. Teeth are a huge thing. The, mm -hmm. the dental, um, the oral health issue with using uh, raw meaty bones. It's, yep. It makes the dog's mouth so much cleaner and so mm -hmm. much healthier. And you come to your veterinarian with all this information and a very healthy looking dog, they're going to listen. <laughs> and they should. And yeah. if they don't, then you find a new veterinarian. Then you find a new yeah. veterinarian. So actually That's that reminds exactly right. me of something that um, I did. I had completely forgotten about this until you just mentioned now. <laughs> when I started raw feeding, there was a dog named Nico back then. It's a dog I had rescued. And we uh -huh. thought he had degenerative myelopathy and raw feeding was one of the things that potentially slow it down. I mean, there's not really a cure for that. But right. he didn't right. have it, luckily. But um, So before we knew that, we just switched into a raw diet. And one of the things I ended up doing, because I'd never raw fed a dog before, before him, I, uh, we did blood tests. So after mm -hmm. we put him on raw food for like a couple of weeks, I went to the vet and said, I'd like to do a full blood panel. I told him, what's our raw feeding? I want to see if he's getting all the nutrients from what we're feeding him, if it's the right raw food. It right. was, was a commercial right. brand at the time, so it most likely would be balanced. And it was. Mm -hmm. But it was, that's the way to do it. So especially when you formulate yourself or you go take a course like the one we're going to talk about in a moment. Mm -hmm. And you do it yourself. To your point, you should talk to a veterinarian. Hey, I'm going to switch to a raw diet. I actually don't want to discuss that with you, particularly that I'm doing this. Right. But I need your help in testing the blood levels and make sure everything is healthy. And I'd like your feedback right. on that. Are you willing to help me with this journey? And if the vet says absolutely not, well, we'll find another vet. <laughs> and, find another vet. And, right. and uh, I would say most vets will probably say, okay, that's a reasonable approach. Um, let, let's do blood tests and let's observe. I mean right. that. At least I would assume that a vet wouldn't wouldn't mind doing that if you come in. I would in. hope so. Yeah, right. I, I would hope and so too. I think, and my vet did. My, I think going. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think going in uh, armed with that confidence in yourself mm -hmm. and you asking them to be a part of your nutrition team. Yeah. You know, that's showing them that you're not just feeding chicken and rice. Mm -hmm. I'll go back yeah. to that because yeah. a lot of vets hear that, and I get it. Mm -hmm. I, I get why they're nervous about that. This this is actually something that, so quick, quick to the vet I was talking about. My vet was older when I did this. He was an old established vet, older guy, probably in the 60s or mm -hmm. so. And he was open to it. It was, I mean, it was mm -hmm. a traditional vet. It was clearly trained in a completely different way, but he appreciated that I'm doing blood tests to figure out if it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And he's like every, like, he always, every time in, he's like, I know you took very good care of your dogs because always like emphasizing that he understands I take good care right. of my dogs because he's seen it. And then yeah. when his son joined the practice, who was younger, um, he was concerned as you about the balance of, of the raw food. When I saw him the first time, I, I, I literally said to him, this is what I said to him, as, 
I understand what you mean. The balance of homemade food can be a problem, but mine was formulated by a nutritionist. Right. And he like, oh, okay. So that put him completely at ease with the concept that mm -hmm. some a professional, which was true, actually made the recipe I'm feeding. So I think what you mm -hmm. said is 100% also what I've seen with, with the concerns that vets have. The moment you come, this was done by a professional. This is not just some random stuff that I just dreamed up yesterday and just thought, hey, let's cook some chicken and rice. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was done by a nutritionist and this is something my dog is doing well with. That changes the conversation right. immediately. That they understand, mm -hmm. okay, there is, they, they may have other concerns about like the, the, the contamination or like, the stuff we right. talked about. But from a nutritional perspective, that pretty much takes the wind out of that argument, out of the sails of that argument. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. it, it also shows the vet that you are not a reckless person about this. You, you're actually thinking. Right. And I think that's what they're probably looking for. If somebody demonstrates that um, you're a responsible dog owner, that will reshift the conversation immediately. Well, let's help them then. That, that's the right approach. Right? So I, I, yes. would, I would expect that to be going quite well in most cases. Not always, but probably mm -hmm. most of the time. So one of the things that we did with mm -hmm. the Feed Real Institute um, as part of Real Dog Boxes, like I said, we created these two courses yeah. and one of them is geared for the dog parent and the other one is geared for the veterinary professional. Mm -hmm. um, the veterinary professional course we haven't released, we're waiting on race certification, which is for continuing education credits. Mm -hmm. We're very close to having that finalized. Um, we're hoping to release that yet this month, but it mirrors the dog parent one. And so we really want veterinarians to at least look at the course and you know they're gonna get CE credits for it. So it's, there's a reason for them to look at it, mm -hmm. but then they can see what the dog parent is learning or at least be able to say to the dog parent, yes, take this course. If you understand the principles that are in this course, then we know that you're doing it properly. Mm -hmm. So if they can work together, that's our, that's our goal is that the veterinary team and, and the dog owner can actually work together yeah. and formulate a really good plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's also something I've, I find hopeful that it can actually reach um, the right audience and change the conversation. Right. Let's talk more. Let's talk more about that program. So, and, and the <laughs> products that you have. I know you have a treat line that's really healthy, but also let's talk about the mm -hmm. program first. Um, okay. And you can also say how much it costs. It's very reasonably priced, I think. Um, but what do people learn? What does it give them? Why should they mm -hmm. take it? So we start out, uh, there's seven units. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is getting to know your dog. We talk about how dogs were domesticated and, and how man and dogs co-evolved. I mean, dogs are basically our link to nature, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've developed this huge bond with them. So we talk about that and we talk about the um, anatomy of the digestive tract and why raw feeding is ideal for dogs. Um, and then, of course, we go into the really basic nutrients, um, you know, protein, fats, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins, and water, give a good rundown of that and how that looks in a raw dog's bowl. Mm -hmm. We talk about life stages um, and how to feed your dog from puppy into a, the senior years. We also talk about kibble mm -hmm. and how it was made, um, how it came about, what AFCO is, which is the governing body. Mm -hmm that says that they have to be complete and balanced. It has to have these nutrients in there. Um, and we get into all of that um, just to give people an idea of what's really going on in the, in the kibble mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. And, and then we talk about transitioning. How do you transition your dog to a raw diet? What to expect? Um, once you've gone through the transitioning, what do you expect from the dog? How do you keep track of how the dog is doing? The one conversation that we have that some people are uncomfortable about is poop. We always look at the dog's poop. Mm -hmm. If the dog's poop is normal, mm -hmm. um, solid brown poops, or it can, there can be a rainbow of colors when you're feeding raw because it depends on what you've given them. Mm -hmm. um, but we talk about that. That's how you can really see what's going on with your dog. Yeah. And then following those clinical markers, going to your veterinarian at least every year and getting blood work done. If that's, the visit that you make every year, mm -hmm. uh, you go once a year and you get that blood work done. Um, and then we have a final unit on dispelling a lot of these myths that dogs shouldn't eat bones, uh, the myth that, you know, bacterial contaminations will happen, the myth of imbalances, you know, just all these different things to kind of wrap up the course with. 
And so, the bone article oh, is the one you had sent me, right? Yes. Yeah, and that, that yes. so that was one. Of, it's a wonderfully detailed article about yes. bones. I learned something about bones, and I know a lot about raw food, but I learned a lot about bones I didn't know. So there's a lot of information in this course. I put that, a lot of uh, work into that. I, absolutely, particular. very obvious that you did. I mean, that that is, uh, it's great information. You will know everything about feeding bones that you ever wanted mm -hmm. to know, never knew you wanted to know, and even didn't right. need, know you needed to know. So. Um, well, and the thing, um, and I think that's a really good point, Ralph, that I base everything on scientific articles. I mm -hmm. look not only at the what you can see on the internet, but because I worked in a university setting, I'm able to really get into their databases and really get in deep to these topics. Um, so that's where all my articles are based on is scientific evidence or textbooks. I do mm -hmm. use some textbooks too. And some of the popular books, there's a couple of books that they're not considered textbooks in a veterinary school, mm -hmm. but they're really good books on the topic. Yeah. Um, and that's, I'm not looking at blogs. I'm not looking at, yeah. you know, websites that are selling something. No, yeah. I've, I've done my due diligence. I've done mm -hmm. research. Um, and like I said, I worked in research for 32 years. So I know how to research and I yeah. know how to write um, based on that. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest challenge was making it practical. Uh, and that's, I say that because there's so much information and mm -hmm. I don't want you walking away from this course going, wow, I know all this, but how do I use it? Yeah. So even when I taught at the university level, it was like, I'm going to teach you information, but I want to teach you how to use that information. Mm -hmm. How do you put that into practice? And so that's where the course differs from so many yeah. is we not only tell you about it, but we say, this is what it looks like. This mm. is how you do it. This is where you go get your supplies. These are yeah. the supplies you need. You know, it's, we spoon feed you almost. Mm. Um, and then we have a workshop that you can get after the course. And that's a DIY real food workshop where we, for two hours on a Saturday morning, go through and help you create meals for your dog. We do one once a month virtually. Mm -hmm. um, they're a lot of fun. You mm -hmm. make your dog's meals. We go and do talk through all of the stuff, reinforce everything you've learned in the course. And you don't have to take the course to be able to take the workshop. You can do it independently. A lot mm -hmm. of people take the workshop after the course to reinforce. Mm -hmm. um, some people take it before and then they're like, oh, I want to know more. And they'll take the course after the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, so we have both of those components for the dog parent and both of them have been very popular. The, the workshop, we try to keep it to eight participants. Mm -hmm. We've gone up to 10 just so that we can really address everybody's issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. how much, how much is the, uh, the dog owner or the pet parent course? It's $150. Very reasonable um, for go, a nutritional course. Yeah, and, uh, then the, <laughs> and then the uh, workshop is an additional $50. Yeah. If you go to, um, my site, which is real.dog slash K, mm -hmm. you'll get 10% off of that. And you can also get 10% off of some of our treats and chews, which we can talk about too. Awesome. We will put all these links um, in the show notes. So we'll put the real dog mm -hmm. and then the, the, actually it's the special link where it gives you a 10% discount in the show right. notes. Real dot dog. Mm -hmm. Real dot dog. Uh, and, and, then, um, go, go and then the feed real.com. That's where all of the courses sit. Yep. Um, the workshop, all of that information. We'll put all of that in the show notes as well. And, mm -hmm. and there is one book you recommend, Feeding Dogs. My copy just arrived in the yes. mail two days ago. So <laughs> I got, got it on Amazon. Like, looks great book. So I have a bunch of nutritional books. That's another one. Yeah. Um, so I will That's add, my favorite one. I know. I know. I will put that into the show notes as well. Um, great. But so one, one thing that just occurred to me, and this is like really kind of a side note to what we were talking about. I used to work, um, I was an expert in business intelligence when I was in the consulting world. It was one of my specialties. And mm -hmm. business intelligence is about turning data into information and making that yes. information actionable, which is exactly the problem that you describe with like, there's a bunch of stuff on the internet and there's also a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. in studies, but you have to transform it into something that's a useful and then pr produce something that's actionable for a person. Because like, I love this, is, that analogy. This, this is great. I have all this information of all this data. What do I do with it? Right. So in, right. in, the, in the world I used to work in, business intelligence is like the, the key ingredient to um, senior executive decision making. The company mm -hmm. has all this data 
and it has to be right. tr transformed <laughs> and manipulated into, well, what does this actually tell us? So how many calls did we get? Whatever it is, right? So how many credit card holders right. do we have? How much debt do they carry? What, whatever the, the thing may be they're doing. Yeah. And then we have to turn this into information that's actually useful in some way. And we'll try to come up with this metrics that make sense to the business. And then you produce charts or something actionable out of it. So here's benchmarks, here's mm -hmm. thresholds, you pass that, you do this, you're under that, you have to take action kind of thing. But it's exactly the same process. And what we basically kind of need is business intelligence for nutrition and, and other things. But that would be one field where that actually would make a lot of sense to apply that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a really um, interesting way to put it because all of those articles that I find, so many of them were mm -hmm. human, stu you know, studies for humans, yep. but they used dogs in the study. So then mm -hmm. I could extrapolate that data and, like you said, pull that data out, mm -hmm. make a, 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 a information, the article that I wrote, and then show you practical ways to take that information. I really yeah. like that analogy. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what you're doing. So it's uh, it just doesn't mm -hmm. exist for a lot of free form or free flowing information. That's the thing. It only exists if somebody pays for it because it's an expensive yeah. process. <laughs> but you, so you on our feedreel feedreel yeah, com, mm -hmm. um, one of the really really useful things on that is our calculator, mm -hmm. and it makes it where you put your dog's age, weight, and activity level in there, mm -hmm. and it gives you exactly what to make for its raw diet. Very, very easy. Um, yes. And you can actually say, I'm gonna make 14 days of it mm -hmm. and click on that and it'll send you a shopping list. Yeah, I've um, played around with it. On super that. easy. One, yeah, agree. Yeah. Very easy to use. It's, that's, that's very helpful. Yes, that's um, been so helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, we're linking articles to that. I'm updating some articles um, as you know, pretty much as we speak. This week I'm mm -hmm. finalizing some. Um, and that's the other thing I do is I constantly go in and update as I learn. I'm, you know, I just read all the time. So mm -hmm. as I learn something right. new, I'm like, oh, I got to go put that in these two articles. And then mm -hmm. I go back in and update them. And yeah, so it, yeah, it's just, it's a ton of data. There's a lot of free articles on there. Um, the food, the, the um, calculator is mm -hmm. free for everyone to use. So easy. I love it. Um, and it's all based on what bone you have available to give to your dog. Yeah. So that that's really nice. Um, and then you said we'll talk about uh, our treats and chews. Yes. So Real Dog Box is actually a subscription box for mm -hmm. all natural air dry treats and chews. Every month you get a new lineup of there's going to be muscle meat, um, fish, and some type of organ meat, and then three different levels of chews, if that's mm -hmm. the box. You can get different boxes, but that's our standard. Mm -hmm. And we change up the... Um, line up every month and give different proteins because variety is really crucial. That really helps balance those meals out over time if you give a lot of different proteins because each protein has its own amino acid profile, gives different, you know, the organs will give different vitamins and minerals. So we just change it all up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a monthly subscription box. We can customize it and you just go to real.dog for that and sign up for those. You can customize it. Let's say your dog has a tree allergy to chicken. Tell us that you'll never get a chicken product. Mm. Um, some dogs don't like fur. We won't send you cow ears with fur if that's the case. So mm. uh, it's all very customizable. Um, and if you're a member of Real Dog, you have what's called the secret shop. And that is like we all get our text messages and then we wait for the secret shop to open. Mm -hmm. So that's different products that we only got small amounts of. Mm -hmm. um, not enough to sustain a whole month of a box to send out to people. Um, and so we drop them in the secret shop and usually within 20 minutes, all secret shop items are gone. Like we yeah. all wait for that to drop. <laughs> and, but you have to be a member to be able to get into the secret yeah. shop. And it's so, basically yeah. a way to get regular high quality meat products and Absolutely. treats that you just can't buy in a store, can't get easily otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, the, the treats yeah. and chews are amazing. And, mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the high quality chews that we have really work their teeth. Um, we have all different structures. We have like pig trotters, the front feet of pigs. We have the front feet of, of lambs. Mm. Um, we have a lot of like cow ears and boar ears, you know, different things. Um, scapula from the uh, bison and other um, cows and other things mm. that really allow those dogs to chew and, and touch different surfaces of their teeth and mm. really get them clean. Um, so, yeah, it's in a great way. We also have meatballs. 
that are air dried that mm. have all six components in them. They have uh, bone, muscle meat, the um, the fish, two different types of organs, and some type of fur, mm. all in this little meatball. And they're great if you forget to thaw your dog's meal out, or let's say you want to go camping and take your dog, take a bag of those and feed him those for his meals. Mm. Um, very good variety of things. That's a good point because in your hiking or camping, you can't really bring raw meat. So these are right. These are good alternatives. Yeah, the, the meatballs are great for yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one other thing I wanted to get back to real quick that you mentioned. Sure. That is, uh, I think that is a very important thing for people to just understand. A lot of scientific studies that were ultimately done on animals were not done for the benefit of those animals. Right. They were done on people. And mm -hmm. a lot, and that's not just on food. That's on lots of things. No, that's so when, on everything. Yeah. So when you read a scientific study and it was done on rats, well, it was done on rats because the thing it was done on is the same between rats and humans. Or this was done on a monkey because that particular thing is the same between a monkey and a human or right. something like that. So it's always right. translatable. Or there's studies that are done on people that 100% translate to dogs, especially in in behavior and in the mm -hmm. in in, op, in the operant modalities of the conditioning, the classical conditioning, all this kind of stuff. So in the training world, the people sometimes oh this was done on rats. These are, rats are not dogs. Yeah, but this is a psychological study. It doesn't matter. That's a mammal and that's a mammal. That's the same. So it's irrelevant right. that it was a different species for this particular thing. It may not be. Right. Yeah. So that that's an important point what you mentioned. And then, right, and especially when they use studies, when they use dogs for studies, mm -hmm. then it was very easy to say, okay, if this worked for the dogs, and then they said, okay, because it worked in dogs, it'll work in humans. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I can use that study for dogs. Yeah, <laughs> so, ob ob yeah, um, obviously. Yeah, so I found a lot, because there aren't mm -hmm. a lot of studies on raw food. Yeah. Because nobody wants to pay for those studies. Mm -hmm. um, scientific studies cost money. Oh, yeah, they cost money. And so the big kibble companies will pay for all kinds of studies mm. based on kibble yep. and other you know products that they make but us feeding raw you know who's going to do those studies so yep. you really had to dig deep and in Europe they're quite a ways ahead of us so I found like several articles out of Sweden mm. um, and some of the UK countries um, so it's yeah it's really interesting that to, to, to see where I can mine this information as you were saying you know data mining and then yeah. <laughs> putting it together yeah so that I mean, there is, uh, I think, the, like research and science is probably funded more actively in Europe at this point, or it's less contested to, to fund that yeah. in Europe than it is here. Right. Well, I mean, we're doing it here. It's not what we're doing it. But we're always quibbling about, should we fund this, right? <laughs> yes, we should. Um, we should probably fund more of it. And in Europe, it's more like, yeah, we should definitely fund a lot of this. So let's study some mm -hmm. more. We should know. Like Acquiring knowledge is right. always worth it. Um, well, and I like the way they're doing the studies too, is they're, they're doing case studies and they're looking at dogs that have been fed raw and the differences yeah. and, you know, and, and pulling all that data together rather mm -hmm. than just doing a scientific study. So some of those studies that I found, I really, really enjoyed reading because it was actual, you know, things that happened and they, they yeah. pulled all that information together and mm -hmm. said, you know, we had 200 dogs that had this condition and they switched to raw and now they don't have, you know, those kind yeah. of things. So it was real life situations. Mm. And, and you, you only get that data. if basically a government body decides let's fund that research because an industry body is not going to do it. Right? There's, right. No, there's exactly. no interest unless it's a mega commercial raw food company now, which we don't have at this point. Um, there would be no industry group who would do it. It would have to be literally something right. nonprofit that would take an interest and say, we're going to spend a couple of million proving this out. And mm -hmm. yeah, that is exactly it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you, that you mentioned earlier about this, um, and I think there's also a thing that is so, so lost on, on so many at this point, because the Internet is such a beautiful place of lot of information for lots of stuff. Right. It's just <laughs> great. Right. You, you can look up how to use any software, like do anything in Photoshop or how to write or how to do this or right. how to do that or research diseases or whatever. Right. But when it comes to certain subjects, and that's a certain, actually a lot of subjects, if you really mm -hmm. want to understand them, the internet isn't necessarily your friend because it's scratching on the surface, it's giving you superficial, simplified information that often has nothing to do with reality. So as you, as you said earlier, blogs about food or little like sales articles or the pet food companies mm -hmm. put stuff up, 
That's not going to be the detailed stuff you will find in scientific research. And it's the same actually in the dog training world. What you read in 80, 90% on websites is not what the actual science is. The actual science Mm -hmm. is quite different, but you would have to literally go read research studies, which who does that, right? So it's it's, it's people like me do it and like others do it. I mean, mean, there's people who do it, you do it. And and there's other dog trainers who do it. I know means the only one. Oh God, no. But right, it's, right. A, it's a minority. It's not the majority, like 80, 80% or so don't. They're just like, oh, here's that superficial piece of information. Let's work with that. Right. While the other 20%, no, no, let's dive in and see if that's actually the way. It, this is really true. Right. Um, so I think that, that's an important point. So internet is wonderful. We can do so many things. We can have this podcast, for example, on the internet. Right, right. Um, <laughs> And this is information we're sharing. So we're part of this now. How is our information now credible based on what I just said? (laughs) But but it's, um, it is. So, I mean, it's it's certainly credible and it's all backed up by the actual research behind it. Well, and the other thing with raw feeding and and Mm. some of these other types of issues, you know, you get on Facebook in these groups I mean, it, people are vicious if, they believe in it. They believe oh, in it. Right, they right. don't. They don't. You know, you get yeah. some really nasty conversations going on. Oh, it's like don't get caught up in that. You know, yeah. it's it's not worth getting caught up in. The other thing that's so nice with our membership mm-hmm. is we have monthly uh, nutrition consults. If you're uh, if you have a monthly membership, which mm-hmm. is uh, twenty two dollars, you get free shipping on the uh, real dog products, and mm-hmm. you get this monthly nutrition a nutritionist consultation. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also have, you can get on our site and ask questions and we'll answer them specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have to get into these Facebook groups that, I mean, I've got, I, you know, monitor them to see if I can help. And some of the people are vicious. Oh, <laughs> some, <know>? most. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I don't, I don't so think don't you can really have any it. useful conversation anywhere on social media at this point. I just, I'm, I mean, Mastodon seems a little bit cleaner. I only had so far only good conversations on Mastodon. I kind of like Mastodon at this okay. point. But uh-huh. everything else, like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, it's just a crapshoot. I mean, why would you want to talk to anybody? It's just like, makes no sense. Yeah. Um, but so here, here's, a, um, here's a, a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson that I really like. Um, how, what exactly did he say? Um, the challenge in life is this, knowing enough to think you're right, but not knowing enough to know you're wrong. So <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a good one. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was one um, I heard yesterday. I was listening to, it was a sales pitch for mm-hmm. um, Ian Billinghurst. His, mm-hmm. He has a master class coming out. But he was like the father of the barf diet and, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of this, this kind of raw feeding. Yeah. And he said raw stands for restore animal health or uh, restore animal well-being. Mm-hmm. And I loved that. Um, and it's exactly what it is. It restores mm-hmm. the animal's well-being or wellness. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a nice, uh, let's adopt that acronym. Restore animal I well-being. I like it. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I was like, I, I wrote that down. <laughs> Yeah. Raw. raw that's it that's it we're restoring mm. the animal's well-being and wellness that's a, that's a good one that's a good one definitely <laughs> anything else you'd like to add i think we've covered it all yeah we've uh, talked about we a lot of things in short i i really encourage people to look at the course um mm. you get on feed reel and look at some of those articles and the ones that are open to the public that aren't behind the paywall aren't as in depth. Um, the ones in the course are going to be a lot more in depth and, and then the ones in the professional course are even more scientific. So. Great. Awesome. So all the links to everything we mentioned will be in the show notes. So for everybody who was listening at the discount code as well to get the 10% off the course or the subscription, It's, it's for both or just for the course. It's for the course or ten dollars off the oh, okay. Um, okay. subscription. Your first mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. There's okay. several different buttons you can push. Okay, mm-hmm. several different buttons. Awesome. So we'll put all we'll <laughs> yeah. put all of that in the show notes. So I, I hope this can be um, a starting point for a good number of people coming into healthy nutrition for their dog and healthy feeding for their dog. Absolutely. Um, as as I've said on uh, many occasions, I've been a, an advocate of raw feeding for a long time. I've mentioned it on many podcasts. I've mentioned it to all my clients. Awesome. I've always suggested. Uh-huh. I fully understand not everybody's going to do this, but understanding what your dog should eat is good, even if you end up buying a bag. 
So you can at least buy a bag that's less bad for your dog versus right. just grabbing one <laughs> the off the shelf. The best you can buy for the money you can spend. That's, yeah. you know, like yeah. you said before. Exactly. Spend, okay. yeah. buy, buy the best food you can afford. And if you can do better, then do better. Um, right. And that, that's fair. We should never shame anybody if they can't, can't go. No, on. never. That's, that's, not, that's yeah. not the way to go. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very you much, so much, Kay. That was awesome. <laughs> um, I will uh, definitely be in touch. I will, we'll, we'll connect Sounds soon great. again. Good talking to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.